Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Breaking News, How to Attract a Young Generation to News. This is a session where we'll be looking at the challenges facing the main news broadcasters in Britain. News delivery has changed massively over the last few years. TV bulletins and TV news in general have held up well and remain a core part of the schedule. But are they ready for the challenge from online, from new devices, and new providers of news, particularly providers catering for a younger audience. Now, I have to say, um, chairing the panel this morning is a bit of a daunting experience in that I've got my, uh, my boss, uh, yes, <laughs> Dor Dorothy Byrne, uh, immediately ahead of me, and I'm uh, the head of uh, news and current affairs at uh, Channel 4. Not only that, Kevin Sutcliffe, uh, the man who uh, brought me back to Channel 4 three years ago, who is now... Uh, head of News Programming Europe at Vice. Uh, indeed, um, the chap I was sitting next to last night at the Metagot dinner said uh, the next hour could be uh, career suicide in 60 minutes. <laughs> uh, not only, uh, you know, if I, if I offend uh, Dorothy, my, uh, my escape routes, I'm in danger of offending them as well. <laughs> um, Mary Hockaday, uh, head of the uh, newsroom at BBC News. Uh, Jeff Hill, Je Jeff Hill of uh, editor of ITV News and John McAndrew. Um, the, uh, the, the executive editor of Sky. Now, it's been a, a, an extraordinary year already. Uh, we're only eight months into 2014. It's been a, a, bit, a really big year for news. Uh, and we'll start with a reminder of some of the key events of this year, as seen through uh, the eyes of the organisation represented by our five panellists, weaved in with some facts about news consumption in 2014 taken uh, from the uh, Ofcom report. So some very interesting statistics there from the uh, Ofcom report. I suppose it's reassuring that 75% of adults still get uh, news from television. Uh, it's interesting that 21% of people say the internet is now the most important source of news, up from just 14% the year before. And perhaps most worrying, though, are the figures that um, the average adult watches 115 hours of TV news every year, whereas the average consumed by 16 to 24-year-olds is just 27 hours. I think if we can kick off by just asking briefly each of you to react to some of those figures and, and the trends that you're seeing. Jeff Hill, perhaps you'd like to start. Well, I take encouragement from that as well, actually, because um, <clears throat> I suppose it was ever thus that adults watch more television news than children. Uh, it, it's unsurprising. Um, but I think uh, uh, what's exciting now is that we have different ways of engaging with a young audience that never existed before. Uh, and we've experienced phenomenal growth in our uh, live stream and our digital offerings. We've got ways of connecting with the, a young audience, as I say, that never existed before. So probably they, they watch and consume more news than they ever did. Uh, and in doing so via different delivery mechanisms, they come to, uh, to trusted brands such as ITV. Mary Hockaday? Yeah, as Jeff says, it's no surprise that young people don't watch as much uh, news as older on television. But I think it is true. We've seen you know, similar evidence to, to these figures that suggest that this younger generation is behaving differently from previous younger generations and do have this much more eclectic, wide-ranging way of, of getting news. Um, but you know, does it mean TV is dead for the younger audiences? Absolutely not. As you see here, it's still the big mainstream deliverer and have millions of people watching it. And of course, part of those millions are younger people. Um, so they're still coming to television news, but they are definitely also coming to powerful, brilliant television, video, you know, visual reportage and, and, uh, and analysis in, in other places as well. And so I think, you know, for, certainly for us, that's the, that's the exciting and interesting challenge is how to get the journalism out in different ways to people wherever they are. John McAndrew. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, what there is, is a lot of news out there. So I think it's an exciting time. There's a lot, a lot of news out there, a lot of content, a lot, a lot of different ways to get it. The challenge for us is to see how we can be agile enough to get into those new media, spot the trends, spot where they're going to, 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 to find their news and find their pictures and their content. So huge effort into social media, into uh, content on digital platforms that will, that will bolster, will support, will, will, will spin off from mainstream television. Mm -hmm. But I still think when uh, important things happen, people switch the telly on. Kevin Sutcliffe, you're the, probably the, the youngest looking member of the panel. Uh, <laughs> may not be the youngest, but... <laughs> the black is <laughs> swimming. 
I mean, I think, well, Vice News isn't TV news. It's, it, it's amazing content that's grown mm. out of Vice, which, which itself was an, is an online thing. So I'm building, we're building Vice News out of already an engaged online audience with an average age in its 20s. So we're in a different space, and we're building that as a response to and what our research showed, that people were moving away, young people were moving away from the forms of, which are old-fashioned forms of TV news, whether that's 24-hour news or whether it's just news bulletin. So we've, we've responded to that. And there, you know, we, some of the things when I was working at Channel 4, how do you engage people for long, younger people for longer periods of time? Some of the sort of sense of that was, oh, they won't watch more than three or four minutes, or that, or that the internet was a place where only they would engage for three or four minutes. You know? So what we found is we've got engagements of up to 20, 25 minutes for foreign documentary. Uh, so what we're, we're doing is building on that. And clearly you've seen in the last four to five months since launch that we've, we've gone for content and we've gone for foreign documentary content. Okay, well. In the end, they want to kind of be able to put it all together or come to a provider where they think, okay, you know, I've seen it, I, and I understand it, and I, and I can trust this. And that is not <coughs> different to where we've ever been. Well, I think it might be, because I think what we're finding is that we've had 100 million video views since we started. Uh, you know, the Islamic State film got 7 million in about a week and a half. You know, our approach and the way we're trying to, um, if you want, package what we do is, is radically different than, than the examples we've seen in terrestrial television. And I think there is an issue, and that's what we, where we've come out of, there is an issue that somebody who's 23, 24 wants to see someone their own age looking at the world with them, for them, and interpreting the world, not seeing someone in a studio talking in a live link to someone else down the line who's then making the world safe or managed for them. So tell us, I think tell us, there's something in that. Tell us about some of the other ways in which your, your uh, video output is different for those people who haven't seen it. Well, and, and if you look at the... We've got a YouTube channel. It's easier to look at that because it actually puts it in sort of some sort of form for you. So, you know, we've committed to the Ukraine. We've done 70, 80 dispatches. They are reporter-led often, or they're just cam camera-led. They, they are um, largely unvarnished and unmediated as much as they can be. You know, they're, they're trying to show you a wider journalistic picture of what's going on. They're not trying to put things down into two to three minutes. In, in the way, you know, there are different pressures on TV news shows than the, we've got. We're, we've got... If something runs for six minutes, it runs for six. If it runs for 36, it runs for 36, because it's good. It's a different format, I, I grant you that. But I, I think it's too narrow to simply say young people will only hear from young no, people. No, I'm not saying that. Let's bring Jeff in. Yeah. Jeff and John. And, 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 Jeff, do you feel challenged by Vice? Do I feel challenged by Vice? Um, not particularly, no, because I think, I think that we're offering quite a different service. Um, well, as you saw there, many of the, um, the techniques that were used uh, in the news reports there were you know, as old almost as television news itself, which is what's been going 60 years now, I suppose, in its current form. I mean, the, you know, Hugh Edwards there, uh, you know, that could have been Alistair Burnett 40 years ago, I suppose, although I don't suppose Alistair Burnett would have stood up uh, 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 <laughs> to do it. And, and the, and the, the down-the-line two-way with the reporter, you know, technique has been going, what, 30 years now. So very little has changed in the format of um, television news over the years. Perhaps the most... Interesting of those, or the most challenging of those excerpts was the, the Vice one from uh, Brazil, where they basically uh, used the, the activists, the video activists, uh, to, uh, in, the, in the piece. Now, would, would other uh, broadcasters get away with, with doing that? What do you think, Mary? Um, it's all about the way you might use this stuff. I mean, I'm sure you know, we've talked more especially about the... Um, your, your ISIS, ISIS um, film, which, you know, there is no doubt, I watched all of that, and I feel that I have some insights and understanding of IS, which I did not have before, and there's no doubt, you know, you had, you had some real access, and it, you showed us stuff in, in a way, you know, I don't know, you know, most of us, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's part of what we're all trying to do. You know, that said, there's no way we would have used it and put it in exactly that form. We would definitely have wanted more context, we'd have wanted more challenge in the piece or clearer explanation of why there wasn't challenge in the piece. Um, you know, I felt I was, looking, I was looking at a very, very sort of close up, uh, you know, view on it all. It was, it was a world without women and 
I was seeing something, but, 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 and I understood from it, but there were things in there that we, we wouldn't have done. And I would read, the, the thing that made me most uncomfortable was almost the, the slightly collusive assumption that this word Islamic State was becoming an actual reality of a real state. It's also on that, um, on that film, if I may make the point, I would have also liked some kind of warning that I was going to see yeah, beheaded bodies yeah. and heads on spikes. Uh, you know, and I was in a newsroom on Wednesday when we made some very tough decisions about covering the story mm -hmm. about James Foley. And there's a huge responsibility uh, on television news broadcasters, because obviously we're regulated by Ofcom. And then, you know, yeah. what comes from that as well is that, that authority and that trust that I was talking about when we're making those decisions about what people are going to what people are going to see. Um, how do you, how do you answer some of those points, Kevin? Well, I don't think it's a trust issue. I mean, we, as I said before, 100 million people been watching this stuff. There's no, there's no question. There's no issue that's been raised for us in, since we launched five months ago about trust in our reporting. There's been, it's not an issue, it's just not there. People are coming back, they trust the reporters, they trust the journalism. We're not just talking about video here, there's a, there's a website full of editorial content that's put up every day as well, just like everybody else's. So, you know, I don't think uh, at all, it's news to me that there's a trust issue for Vice News, so that's the first thing. It's, the material in that film speaks for itself, and I think everybody, everybody has watched it, and it, it's, you know, it's excited the most extraordinary set of debates. You now know what they're like. You now know what it's like to be in Saudi well, Islamic what would, State. What, what were but, the terms under mean, which you yeah. went there? So, I'm sorry? What were the terms under which you went the there? The terms were the same journalistic terms as anybody else. We negotiated, we asked, and we got in. But we got in because of a particular way you know, the particular relationships we were managed to, over a long period of time, get. Uh, what I don't understand is, I think that is an ex there are extraordinary sequences and scenes there that you take away as shocking, chilling. The, you know, the children being indoctrinated, the, the, the father asking his child if he wants to be a suicide bomber or not. These things, you, you can, they speak for themselves, you see. What, but what, they, but, but they, 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 they went they, unchallenged, what, though, didn't what they? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to ha try and bring in some reporter who then goes, I'm going to now wonder. It's not possible. It's a documentary access-based film. And I think it, it absolutely, you come away from that with no, there's no doubt what's going on. There is no doubt what those people are about. It is chilling, it's brutal, and it's unacceptable. To, to the point about uh, the warning, we do put warnings on some videos and on, on others. We take judgments on each of them. And, and on that one, we thought... Do you think that was a mistake, not, not warning no, people No, I think that we would, have put a warning, we would have put a warning on if we felt it needed a warning. We put warnings on others, which we felt were really particularly brutal. Um, so uh, se sorry, others. severed heads on streets that doesn't really that, meet that criteria. We took, we, we took that decision, and I'm happy with the decision that we took. And um, to go back to this notion that somehow this is about trust, it's not in the slightest about trust. That's a, an extraordinary film. It's played around the world. It, it, last week was the, the subject of American television. So, you know, it has... You know, the debate around ISIS has been massively enhanced by that film and what it brought back. It's a brave piece of filmmaking. Would you do it now? It's the same question, you know, it's a case by case, isn't it? If you can get access and you think you can get that access safely in some way, and then you would try, well, what's the story now? Yes, of course, you're always trying to get to the story. You're always trying to bring back something. I think at the moment, for reasons, that I think that was a window. We, there was but, but I mean, after, f after James Foley, if you got access today, you would go back, would you? Well, if you could, if you could do it safely. Yes. Well, <laughs> but, but but would you ask tougher questions? Well, if what you went do you mean tougher? I don't get that this was not a tough film. It's just a different way of viewing it. I mean, you know, you're seeing this through the prism of, you know, there was a thing at the weekend. Why didn't you ask this? Why didn't? You? There are questions in there. In in the scenes with the courts, he says, you know, he says, you know, is is this in line with international law? And they laugh and say it's in line with God. You know, what more do you want? He asks that question. He asks them. There are questions in there, but I just don't get that. This this film watched as a whole. What do you come away with? Do you come away with thinking that this is some sort of PR opportunity for IS? I don't think you do. They don't need that. They've got their own very sophisticated PR, you know, social media extraordinary. You know, the, the timing of the video this week, that is all to do with them. What we brought back was this is what they're about. They are theological ideologues building a utopia in there. You know, that's what you get. Dorothy, would you have run the uh, ISIS film, Kevin's ISIS film? Well, to be honest, I've been away, so I haven't uh, seen that actual film. But in general, I would say that there's room on... 
we're, this is dividing up between Hugh Edwards standing in the studio <laughs> and Vice. <laughs> and honestly, um, <laughs> that's just not realistic. If I look at, I mean, I, kn I know that Vice has covered many of the same mm. things we've covered. We went and did the mm. Romanian tunnels. That was very popular on the programme. And it's been massively popular. I, I think our second most popular thing this year online. Um, so that sort of special content works for us as a 10 or 15 minute thing on Channel 4 News. And then it works online. And then you did the tunnels. And then you were in, where were you? Yemen or somewhere. And we were in Yemen. Oh. You know, actually, there are so many similarities between our journalism at Channel 4 and Vice's journalism. And I think the interesting thing is to look at what is it that people like about it. And I think they really have a great passion to know about the world. There are, you know, the figures that you showed are of people, they're going on the internet and they're seeing all these places all over the world that they didn't know about and they want to know more about mm. them. And, you know, you can do that for them mm. and we can do it for them. And they definitely like it long form. So mm. actually for us, you know, Unreported World or Dispatches or Channel 4 News, a longer piece, all those, uh, all that content, we are now finding that people want, but we've got to take it out to them. Mm. It, we, we can't expect mm. them to necessarily come and watch it at eight o'clock on a Monday night. How, how much debate went on in all of your newsrooms this week about the James Foley pictures? Oh, and all a thought. lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and what, what, what was the debate about and what did you decide in the end? Uh, well, in our case, uh, I got a call at about half past 11 at night saying this, uh, this video is out uh, and so went in to look at it. Um, we decided that initially we wouldn't show uh, any of it uh, other than sort of still frames at the top with the, with the sort of text on it, a message to Obama. We'd run the audio, uh, which we uh, sort of subtitled. Uh, we didn't show the stills of him uh, in the moments before his death until uh, nine o'clock that night. Um, uh, we did show uh, through the, in the daytime a still frame of the, uh, the uh, guy who said he was the killer. Um, so, because clearly his British accent made him the story, I didn't feel, especially in the daytime, there was any need to see the pictures of uh, James Foley in, in, in the last few minutes of his life, um, and very comfortable with, with that. And, and uh, Jeff, I mean, ITN, I think I'm right in saying, were the first people to run the, um, uh, the, 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 the film last year from Woolwich. Uh, yes. Which is, I think, is, I would argue, is a, is, is a similar decision, or arguably a similar decision. How much debate went on at ITN about it? Well, this week. I, I wasn't there. So. Oh, right. But I, I know a lot of debate went on. Um, and if you look at the issues, uh, you know, there's a, there's a massive public interest defence uh, if you're looking at the various sort of defences under Ofcom. But editorial justification, this is happening in broad daylight on a British street. Uh, and, it, and it was you know, filmed by, by a member of the public and showed the shocking nature of what we were, what we were viewing. Coming back to the uh, James Foley, we had a very similar set of experiences at ITV News. I chaired a meeting of our senior people and we went on for more than an hour discussing exactly yeah. how we're going to do this. But that gradiated response, I think, uh, throughout the day, what we had on lunch, evening and 10, and it, and it changed. And certainly at no stage were we showing any of that video, which is ultimately yeah. propaganda. No, we, we, but you we, had to, we showed a small still because you need that to put that into context. To, to, to bring home the story and yeah, why we, the we, we slightly altered it as the day went on. I think it was right that we sort of, we, you know, we mm. must have had sort of, uh, you know, three or four serious meetings and discussion about, as you say, a sort of gradual response to it. Mm. Um, we, we, were you around there a few yeah, 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 no, and, you know, very, very similar. Lots of discussion, and some of us remembering back to um, Daniel Pearl and mm -hmm. you know what happened mm. with him and what we all did then. And actually, I think all of us probably did slightly less now than we did then. What we did yeah. was use a still of um, the, 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 the two shots, so James Foley and his killer, from you know, the earliest part of it, where it's, it's just a terrible thing to say, but the, the most neutral still we could possibly find, but we then moved quite quickly to uh, focusing on the, on, on the killer. But, and, and in the audio, again, we used audio of the killer, because as um, John said, the issue of his you know, accent, who he is, mm. very, very salient. We never used any of the audio, no, no, and we no, used no moving video. 
I think what was interesting was the debate that was going on outside the newsrooms as well. I mean, certainly in social media, it was a very, yeah. uh, it was a very sort of heated debate, and, and we got quite a lot of positive reaction for the approach we'd taken. I think the approaches of yeah, all the broadcasters well. were pretty yeah. similar. Yeah. yeah. Do you think perhaps young people wanted more than that, Kevin? More than what was shown? No, I don't think so. I mean, they can find they it anywhere. They can find it. I mean, that, yeah, sure. that, they, well, they, they go see it. So, I mean, we, we tended... We, we did some editorial out of the US. Our, our response was to put back up uh, a couple of pieces we'd done with British jihadis to remind you that this is what they're like. We did one quite recently uh, with an unmasked guy walking about explaining what he was doing. So we, we sort of brought some context back up from previous videos uh, as a way of doing that. I think one really interesting thing about this conversation as well, we're talking almost exclusively about foreign news. And, you know, that's for very good reason. Well, I mean, my yeah. goodness. I want to, you know, I want to ask you yeah. about something that isn't um, foreign news. Good. Um, uh, and I want to come on to the whole question of exclusive scoops. It seems to me that one of the transformations in my 35 years in this business is the pressure to produce new stories, scoops, uh, revealing stuff is huge now compared with then. Uh, I mean, it's said, Mary, that uh, uh, in Mark Byford's time, he, his view was that they weren't, you were, the BBC was not... Uh, meant to compete with the newspapers for exclusives, uh, but apparently under James Harding, this has now changed. Is that is that true? Well, I wouldn't put it in some sort of you know binary um, individuals like that. I mean, we're a news organisation, all of us news organisation. We like stories, and when we can, we like to get them quickly, and when we <coughs> can, we like to get them first. And you know, all, all of us get different stories first at, at different times, and all of us can be very proud of that. But there's a um, feeling this... that you went over the top with well, literally we... uh, with Cliff Richard. We got some information that made us think there was a story there. We pursued it. Um, we pinned it down. Um, we did absolutely nothing to jeopardise the police inquiry. Um, when the story actually started happening and become public, the search, but a we were there. A helicopter over the his helicopter, house? The helicopter is a, is a news gathering tool that we all use. And as it's, it's important just to be really precise about this. So we did put the helicopter up to gather pictures of the location, because that was the best news gathering way to get pictures of the location and of the property. Well, hang and on, you outside the house. And, the... We used those, the, and we used those pictures in the packaged and reported storytelling. The only live shot with the helicopter that we used was in the middle of the afternoon, where we were quite high up and we were shooting the police cars as they were leaving. But doesn't the uh, attention you gave that uh, raid actually jeopardise his chances of a fair trial if he ever comes to trial. Why would that be? I mean, we reported what happened, and then everybody else started reporting what happened, and everybody's gone on reporting what's happened. And many people have actually spoken to in papers have gone much further than we and other broadcasters did after that first uh, day in the day two story where South Yorkshire Police talked about other people coming forward. So something happened. We reported it accurately. Uh, our coverage, and I'm sure everybody else's, was shot through from the very beginning with his clear denials. Would everybody else on the panel have covered it with a helicopter in the same way, same length? Well, we never would have put a helicopter up, of course. Put <laughs> 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 a helicopter up for Prime Minister's question. Um, uh, I mean, well, Jeff, would you have done well, it the same? Are you well, we you... share the helicopter, so yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we shared the pictures, we though, shared... so... so yeah. I, mean, I think it's. Uh, I think Mary's right. You know, the, 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 you know, if, if one of the most successful and, and, and well-known performing artists of all time is, you know, is having his uh, house searched by by the police, you know, it, it's a new story, and we're within our rights to cover it. It is, and we, you know, we, we employ journalists because of their contacts and the ability to get ahead on the story. That's what we're for. We want to get ahead on the stories, and you know, they were ahead on the story. I mean, the other question, of course, is um, whether should be more leeway given to traditional, uh, the broadcasters on the traditional channels to, uh, how should we put it, editorialise uh, or to let their feelings be known a bit more. Um, and of course there's been some controversy, Dorothy, over Jon Snow's statement mm. on uh, YouTube um, about Gaza. Were you happy with that? I think it was fantastic to hear, and that's why so many people have watched it, to hear a journalist telling you uh, what it feels like to be there. Yeah. It's a different Yeah, but were you happy way, with it? Uh, yes. You were happy It's with a it. different way of people um, expressing their feelings to what oh. your young bearded people are doing. And... Um, <laughs> 
And there's, there are some women as well. There are some women reporters. There seems to be well. quite a lot of blokes <laughs> from what I see. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting, actually, that um, it's because it was John that mm. people appreciated it. And people talk a lot about, oh, people just want to get their news anywhere. They don't want other people to editorialise for them. But actually, when there's so much news around, I think that people do want to go to somebody that they know and trust, who might well have a beard and be young, um, and, and for them to reflect on it, because they well, don't really know, um, they don't really know the, the details of what is happening in the world, and they want, they want guides. So they would, can trust. Why, why not let him do it on the programme then? Would you have been happy if he'd had done it on the programme? I think it's everybody knows that online what you do is different to um, what you would do on screen. I don't think on screen people want to hear the journalist talk about well, you've just how said they he do, feels. They do want to hear it. They did no, want to hear no, it. No, but say that I think it's thing. in a different place. I think on the programme they want to hear the the news. And it, that can be very engaged and very passionate. But I think somebody talking in that reflective way, that's much more like a it blog. Been, it was a video blog you think it would of have someone reached? saying at the end of the week, this is, when I saw all those children die, this is how I felt. That, I, I, I think it was very appropriate to uh, where it was. And it's, it's absolutely um, uh, appropriate for a, a man to talk about his feelings in a passionate way. Mary, Mary, would you have been happy for John Simpson to do that? Well, I think this, this um, the Jon Snow video, a lot of things got conflated. A lot of people talked about impartiality or not impartial and all the rest of it. I think it was emotion. I think actually the debate is about, you know, the place of sort mm. of personal feeling and emotion. Mm. Because the, the pure editorial content actually the, the, the conveying of the story of what happened in Gaza, and indeed what happened in Israel, but if we just stick with Gaza, and you know, the, the sense of the scale of it, and the damage of it, and the number of people dying, the number of children dying. You know, Jeremy Bowen did some incredibly forceful, taut, two and a half minute packages, and you know, our colleagues did as, as well, where you were left in no doubt about what was happening in Gaza in an editorial way, and he raised the issue of war crimes. You know, so I don't, I don't think it's right to think that there's some sense that you know, editorial in terms of the strength of storytelling or even the sense of a judgment and assessment, somehow that was radically different to what we're able to do in, in more conventional formats. What John did was share his feelings. And again, that's not a crime. By and large, it's not what we do within the formats of a, of a bulletin. I think people generally there want a sense of a sort of, um, you know, it, it, that there's not the reporter's own feelings between them and the, what's happening, and they set the feelings right. aside, and we're eyewitnesses and explainers of what's going on in the world. So I think there are actually different things. And other journalists, again, actually, you mentioned Jeremy. I mean, Jeremy has written elsewhere about the impact of some of the war reporting he's done on him. It, it was emotion, not editorial. But would you have been happy for John Simpson or Jeremy Bowen to have done what Jon Snow did and put it on YouTube? Well, um, not in exactly the same way, but the notion that there is a place where journalists can talk about, write about what it's like to be, to be a reporter. Um, I thought the, the end of it, you know, I, I kind of felt for John. I, I didn't think it was actually that compelling a thing to, to, to end with. And, and is allowing journalists in the way that Jon Snow did to express his feelings about the story he's just been covering. Uh, one of the ways in which we might be able to get back some of that uh, young audience or, or keep hold of them. I mean, is this, is, is this part of the, 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 the answer here? Well, I think, it, I, I think it is. There's a passionlessness about a lot of news. And I, I, I think we do have to re-examine all the time how we tell stories because I, I don't think people mean to be passionless and it may be that if you're putting nine stories into 24 minutes and they all get so short that that's how it ends up but I, I think it is a problem and I think you know we're lucky because we've got an hour and, and therefore it's easy for me to but, say but, that. But does Ofcom prevent no, Ofcom doesn't say 
anything about um, being passionless. And in fact, I went once to a big Ofcom seminar in which um, they said uh, that they would, um, they actually cited a film that they really liked that we'd done, which was Peter Hitchens getting very angry because David Cameron was insufficiently right wing. And um, there was a young man there from the BBC who was then head of current affairs, George Entwistle, and he, he commented that indeed the BBC had looked at this. And I think what he said was that they had decided that they would like to have a bit of passion. So I think, but it's, I think it's quite key, isn't it? I mean, I mean, we, we, you know, connecting to the journalist. Journalist's a real person, to, trying to do something, trying to make sense of the world on the ground, and that's obviously what we're trying to do. And we found that that, that combination, and going forward, maybe that is the debate about what is mm. what is a journalist now, and what do the audience or the people coming well, to I think expect? There's real John, yeah. yeah, I think there's real clamour for people to see more of what we do and how we go about it. And we're very lucky too. We've got 24 mm. hours. Okay. Mm. So we've got a, um, quite an exciting sort of promo campaign launching. It's all real stuff of people having doors slammed in their face, getting knackered, trying to get to the airport, going, you know, wanting to go somewhere and trying no, to well, get that's, that's the mechanics. But yeah, yeah, but no, I think what it shows you is, is that these are, these are people, people who are going out in pursuit of these stories, experiencing, experiencing you know, fear, tiredness, disappointment. Uh, and I think, especially with our younger audience, they seem to really, really respond to that. I think the challenge for us is to get that younger audience back in. in, in, in so more, more, more passion, more emotion, more feelings on Sky? No, 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 I mean, I don't have a strong view about the John Snow thing. I think that suddenly got confused with news, actually. I mean, that was a kind of personal thing. I mean, uh, I, I mean I'm, I'm happy with the way our, our presenters go about it. And how about you, Jeff? Briefly? <laughs> Well, I mean, I just think, I mean, not the John Snow thing in particular, but, you know, it, it is a very crowded market we operate in now, and which is great. As we talked about, you know, young people are engaging uh, with news to probably a greater extent than they ever have, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, one thing that will outlive the internet and all of us is the need for, the, you know, both sides of the story, balanced reporting, truth and impartiality. And I just think that if we do anything to dilute our brand, we lose our USP in the market. And so that's what I'm always conscious of. Okay, we well, have the... to avoid being a bit pompous. I think, it, it, you know, there's a bit of pomposity. And I think that was what also people huh. liked about John. You know, he was just saying what he felt. Hmm. And also a bit of humour. You know, I have to say, people quite like you, Michael, because you're sometimes a bit ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's, let's, move, let's move on a bit. The, the, the threat to television news isn't just from uh, longer form video news like Vice, uh, but other uh, online uh, news outlets. For example, uh, I'll just show you in a moment, two pieces of just 20 seconds each from Now This News, which does very short clips of footage and graphic statistics, um, which try and sum up the situation. Here's a couple of them. So here we are. We've got... Lots of young people watching websites like that, like Vice, uh, picking and choosing their news off the internet rather than watching traditional television bulletins, uh, watching it on tablets and iPhones. Uh, no, we're, we're unsure about whether they will switch back to television news later in life. Um, and we're all worried about keeping our young oars and, getting, uh, and, 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 and winning them back. What are we going to do about it? Jeff, what do you think needs well, to be done? I mean, as I've been saying, this is an incredibly exciting time to be uh, in television news because, you know, it, it, I don't see it so much as a threat. It's more of, a, as an, of an opportunity because there's so many different ways in which we can engage now. And, I mean, those short snippets of, I mean, it's kind of headlines, really. It's not, you couldn't really describe that as the full story. But if that's bringing in an audience into, into the broader content, then, you know, that's fantastic for us. There's some examples. We, we do, we started to introduce those kinds of things on our live stream and we're looking to do sort of short snippets of video uh, a bit more. It does, it, uh, we had a, a great piece from uh, Robert Moore in America where he was describing the big freeze and he poured some boiling water out of a, <laughs> a, a, a cup and it froze before it hit the ground. You know, that was copied around the world and that was shared around the world, which is, which is great. Because on the point about the growing up and moving over, I think it's interesting that we, we are talking almost 
entirely about foreign news apart from the Cliff Richard thing. But what is really important about growing up, and I think, is you know, when you get over 34, when you have a stake in society, you have a mortgage, you're interested, we haven't talked about interest rates, we haven't talked about pensions, mm-hmm. we haven't talked about the NHS, yeah. we haven't talked about elderly mm-hmm. care. You know, these are things that actually don't mean a lot to you when you're 18, but mean everything to you when you grow up. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, rather than go around the panel, I think, actually, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end of our slot. Let's, let's throw it open to the audience and see if there's any questions, either for the panel as a whole or, or particular individuals. Does anybody um, like to um, add to the... Uh, to the debate. Can I add to it then? Well, yes, go on then. then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, don't let any questions. Any questions. Um, yeah, see, I, I think this is important. And, but actually, um, you can be 18, you can definitely be 25 or 29 and bothered about jobs, houses. You may not be your mortgage yet, but it might be rent, might be all kinds of stuff. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about is, you know, output um, that is particularly aimed at younger audiences. So for us, that's Newsbeat and that's radio journalism, but actually that team is now going very multimedia and has been creating more and more video and there's um, some, you know, much more to come on that actually later in the autumn in terms of them moving across to being a really digital proposition. Um, and uh, there's, you know, brilliant... BBC Three News content, it, it's all there. Short form matters, long form matters, you know, how, how, Murdered by My Boyfriend, an incredible BBC Three documentary about domestic violence in this country, watched um, by, I think, you know, eight million, interestingly, half on the telly, half on iPlayer. Um, so these patterns of, of consumption, they're definitely changing, but the th- appetite for the content is we, there. We, and we're also doing the, you right. know, the short uh, form, whether it's a minute explainer, whether it's Instagram. We're all You've got one interesting right. person. We've got, we've got, right. Hello, oh, I've warmed up a question. We're so that, grateful. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, at least I, I assume you want to ask, yes? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just curious about how often you talk to young people about how they want to consume news. Um, forgive me, it sounds like you're sort of saying young people do this, do this, do that, but how often do you talk to young people about how they'd like to consume well, their news? Before, before you, could you, just, could you just tell us who you are, please? Oh, sorry, I'm, my name's Laura. And, um, and, and you're here from? Um, I work for the BBC. Right, OK. <laughs> well, we've done a, a series of focus groups recently for a new campaign we're launching, which is designed to address exactly that, because a lot of what we've discussed today is uh, from us to the younger audience rather than from the younger audience back. So. In September, we're launching a, a campaign based exactly on that called Stand Up Be Counted. Now, this is a digital space we're going to offer to people. It's aimed at 16 to 25 year olds, and they can uh, debate, post videos, commenting on our news stories that we're providing, but also there's a sort of open mic area where they will debate with each other, send in all kinds of material. And it's pretty well, we'll moderate it for taste and decency. That is a home for exactly that. So, we're going to sort of tap into it. I would expect to see that content that they provide play into our, um, you know, starting with sort of Scotland coming soon and many other issues, but into the general election. And that's a, that's a, a real big deal for us. It will, you will see it on TV, but it's essentially going to be part of our app and our digital thing. And I hope that rather than us sort of sitting around going, well, we think they might like this or they might like that, they're going to tell us what stories they want us yeah. to do, mm-hmm. where, we're going, where we're getting it right, where we're getting it wrong, and, and hopefully bleed into our mainstream coverage and bring... I mean, we're into doing a major piece of work at the moment, and we do that maybe three times a year. Mm. And one of the things that is really clear from the piece of work at the moment is when you talk about young people, it's, uh, it, it's like talking about people with two arms. I mean, it doesn't... It, they're so different. Yeah. And what we are specifically looking at is how can we serve the different audiences? You know, and I, I'd be very interested actually with Vice. Mm. Um, do, uh, w- maybe I'm wrong in thinking it's that more young men watch it than young women. No, it male skews at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe you get an older woman. Are, 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 you, are you planning to run around that? and yeah, well, prepare to yeah. help? And, I mean, I, I was just going to say we. I mean, yeah, we've got real real time analytics on the site, so you can see who's on the site at any given moment. Uh, you know, it's extraordinarily democratic. You put stuff up. You just read what they say underneath. There's, the dialogue is, is instantaneous and ongoing with the audience. But that, that, but that is a worry for you that you, you, you want to correct. Is it? That's not a well, that's not a worry. What the dialogue being no, no, ongoing? No, no, no. The, the fact that it, more more of your view is a mess. It's like it, it's like like any any publishing venture. You know, you're looking at who's coming to it at any moment, and and you, at the moment it skews a bit more male. Yeah, so that's an issue. We, we've got to really. Um, 
work on trying to encourage young people who aren't that interested in news to be interested mm. in news as mm. well. I think yeah. as public mm. service right. broadcasters. Right. Can, can we bring in here? Um, can we bring in here Real my mouth. old uh, editor at uh, Channel 4 News, Stuart Purvis? In fact, the man who appointed me a television reporter 30 years ago last Saturday, Stuart. Uh, you weren't so ridiculous in, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you're wonderfully ridiculous, Michael. Uh, look, really interesting discussion, but I think, aren't we missing just one element here? Television news has always been, has always been devised, sold, marketed in time blocks. Initially of 10 minutes, then half an hour, up to an hour. And what's been created is a much more time-efficient way of people getting their dose of news. So isn't the long-term threat, and it's not five years, 10 years, it might be 15, 20 years, so we shouldn't worry too much, that in a sense we've created a technology which makes long for mid-form television news of time blocks less efficient than the new ways of doing it. I'd say that not necessarily, because it takes well, a long... Well, how can that not be... Well, Jeff, how can long... that not be right? <coughs> well, it Kevin, takes a... Kevin is... You know, Vice News is offering a piece on ISIS which you can watch, if you're interested, when you like, at the times you like, and, you know, and for as long as you like. You don't have to sit down for a fixed time, or even within a 24-hour block like John's. Mm. And you don't have to wade it. through all the pieces about mm. the economy and all the other things yeah. you that don't have. That to be more time But lots of people do. Yeah. And they yeah. do. Yeah. 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 Including yeah. lots of young people. Still. Sorry, what I was going to, point I was going to make is yeah. that the flip side of the argument is it actually takes quite a long time to surf the net and look through various mm. sites and go, what's the most important thing? Well, they're saying this and they're saying that, they're saying the other. You, you know, you come to someone that you have that relationship and that engagement with and you trust them and you look at them and you say, well, if I invest you know, less than half an hour of my time, I'm going to get the whole lot in one in one form, and just one, I think it is slightly exaggerated. I mean, we, you know, it's five years, 10 years, the death of TV news, death of TV news, death of TV news, death of the package, death of this, death of that. You know, our audiences are growing, and I think it shows that yeah. at this time, when there is a plethora of sources, people want to be guided by the hand and just take them through. Okay, Stuart, if you, were, if you were still editor of ITN, what would you be doing to... Uh... Well, no, like, I don't fault anything that anyone's doing. Right. I'm just being practical yeah. about people's use of people's time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, when I started in the business, there was only one, two things you could watch at 10 o'clock. Mm. You could watch the ITN News at 10, or we could watch a drama on the BBC. No wonder we had fantastic figures. <laughs> <laughs> now people have got a plethora okay, yeah. of choice, and they're choosing yeah. to use their time more time-efficient ways. That's my only point. Okay, Stuart. Well, thank you. Yeah, very, very briefly, the gentleman at the back, uh, if I'm allowed, yeah? Very, if you can just very briefly, just make a point and um, you won't even get an answer. <laughs> oh, right. Um, well, actually, it was a tiny couple of points, but incredibly quick. One um, on the question of the news and being able to get at whatever time of day it is, your session is called, sorry, Toby Seifert from Enders Analysis, yeah. your session is called Breaking News. Question is, does that then have an effect on what you do in the big news bulletins much later? The second thing, which I'm slightly surprised by, because for me, one of the outstanding things in the Ofcom report was just how much of news online is being read rather than watched. There hasn't been a single discussion of any bit of scripting and things. Is this an opportunity for you? And does it lead down different paths? Um, it's not just about watching videos, and perhaps, perhaps less about that than where you can read and access things. Well, maybe that's um, a subject for a debate at the festival <laughs> next year. We have to uh, wind it up now, but thank you very much indeed. Jeff Hill, Dorothy Byrne, Kevin Sutcliffe, Mary Hockaday, John McAndrew, thank you all Thanks very much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.